you've heard me say before in the office, hypertension really isn't a disease. It may have an ICD-10 code, but hypertension or high blood pressure is just a response to your environment. So tonight we're going to talk about what hypertension is and how you can actually measure it appropriately and we'll answer any questions you guys have. So if you have questions, just drop them in the comments and we'll answer them uh, when I get to the end of the quick chat here. So for those that haven't uh, logged on before to see me do this, I'm Dr. Michael Twyman, board certified cardiologist here in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm the owner of Apollo Cardiology, where we focus on heart attack and stroke prevention. Hypertension is one of the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Um, it's generally uh, not well treated in the community, and it's also something that's not well understood sometimes on what is actually driving it. So, you know, what is high blood pressure? Pretty much anything greater than 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. History, well, why is it millimeters of mercury? So, uh, I don't currently use it on a routine basis now, but we have it at Apollo. Uh, we have some old school mercury uh, signal and monitors. So, mercury, uh, is in a tube, you put a blood pressure cuff on the arm, you pump up the blood pressure cuff, you see the column of mercury rise, and then you put a stethoscope on their artery and open up the blood pressure cuff, and as the blood rushes back in, you hear the corticoff sounds. The first sound you hear is the systolic blood pressure, or the quote, top number. The sounds go away, kind of get muffled a little bit, and then when you can't hear the sounds anymore, that's the diastolic pressure of the bottom number. So you're watching the little column of mercury drop down. Those aren't as common anymore. You usually see the, uh, the air ones or automated ones. Um, they can be accurate, but you generally need a mercury one to say it's fully calibrated. So I put a poll in my uh, IG stories earlier today, and I must have some healthy people following me because it looks like it's about a 60-40 split. Most people say that their average blood pressure is running less than 120 over 80. And so that'd be optimal. So you're less likely to have endothelial dysfunction when that happens. So a quick refresher, what is the endothelium? It's the one cell, one cell thick surface of your artery uh, lining. Essentially, it's about the surface area of six tennis courts, and it releases nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a short-lived gas that causes the muscle and artery to relax, so that improves blood flow, which keeps blood pressure down. But nitric oxide also acts like a non-stick uh, surface when it's being released. Things that are floating through the lumen or where the blood is don't stick to that artery wall. If they don't stick to the artery wall, less likely to get retained in the artery wall, less likely to drive uh, atherosclerosis. So high blood pressure, again, anything over 120 over 80. Start with, you know, how to best measure it because, you know, what you measure uh, can get, uh, what's, the, what's the exact saying? You know, that what gets measured gets monitored or you can improve it, something like that. Um, but, you know, tell me if this is your experience normally getting your blood pressure at a doctor's office. Can't find a place to park, you rush in, uh, there's a busy office, they grab you, they slap you down on the chair, they check your blood pressure and say, ooh, it's really high. Yeah, it probably is. So that's not the most optimal way to have your blood pressure checked. Uh, blood pressure should be checked, you know, with no stimulants in the system, so no caffeine, nicotine, or alcohol in the system for a few hours. Uh, you should ideally be resting somewhere nice and quiet for five minutes. Your feet should be supported on the ground. Your back should be supported. Uh, you shouldn't be like floating over a uh, exam table and kicking your legs over the edge. Uh, and then a blood pressure cuff should be on your arm. Now, some patients will have a wrist cuff at home. From my experience and many doctors' experience, those are highly inaccurate. I've seen them off by 30, 40 points either way, too high. 30 40 points too low so you think your blood pressure is normal at home you come to the office and your blood pressure is very high so the wrist cuffs uh probably again test on guest scenario bring your blood pressure cuff to your doctor's office you know we do that routinely at the office we calibrate people's home blood pressure monitors so but back to the story should ideally be a brachial cuff and somebody should be listening ideally to the sounds now the automated machines can work but again those need to be calibrated to make sure that they're not uh um, inaccurate. So you should also get your blood pressure checked in both arms. Um, there's a chance that you could have a blockage in your subclavian arteries, the arteries that are under your collarbone. Also going to be an issue with high sympathetic tone where the arteries are going to constrict it more on one side. So 
that's kind of your autonomic nervous system uh, misbehaving on one side or the other. Uh, in our office, we have a device called the Max Pulse. You know, it looks at the arterial elasticity, which is a good metric of how springy the arteries are. But it also does three minutes of heart rate variability, which is a metric of how much stress your body's sensing at that one moment. If you have high synthetic tone, uh, that's probably going to be driving your blood pressure up. High cortisol, high adrenaline tend to follow that. So deal with your stress. You know, meditation, yoga, deep breathing, exercise, whatever you like to do to deal with stress, that will help lower your blood pressure. But let's say you have high blood pressure. Okay, you know, what is it doing to your cardiovascular system? You know, if you have high blood pressure, you very likely have a low nitric oxide, as I said earlier. Low nitric oxide, you're much more likely to start developing atherosclerosis, fatty streaks in your arteries. High blood pressure can lead to strokes, can lead to heart attacks, can lead to kidney failure, can lead to you know, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, so you do not want to have high blood pressures for long periods of time. It does not mean you automatically need medications, Generally, unless your blood pressure is consistently greater than 160 systolic and the risk of stroke really starts logarithmically going up, but you want to first figure out, you know, what is driving it. And there's, you know, multiple things that can be driving it. You know, for example, you know, you have a high inflammatory burden, so high sensitive CRPs up, high myeloperoxidase, high LPPLA2, uh, high oxidized LDL. You know, just abnormal lipids at times can drive it because it can damage the glycocalyx of the endothelium. High insulin, high glucose, heavy metals, mercury, lead are the big ones. Um, micronutrient deficiencies, low magnesium, low potassium, your vitamin D deficient. Uh, so here's hundreds of things that can drive hypertension. Um, so you need a comprehensive blood work panel to kind of figure out what might be driving it as well. But what happens to the arteries if you don't uh, have uh, well control of the blood pressure? The arteries start getting stiffer. So we have a couple of devices in the office that can measure the arterial elasticity. So your arteries should act like an accordion. They should expand and contract quickly. That's done with a max pulse device, a little finger clip. Um, and then there's a device we have called an ACCOR, which measures your sensory blood pressure. That's what your blood pressure your heart arteries and brain and kidneys actually sense. It's not the same as the blood pressure that are in your biceps. Uh, the blood pressure in your sensory aorta is generally going to be a little bit lower, but that's the pressure you're really trying to target. So when it used to be an invasive cardiologist, we used to put a pigtail catheter up the radial artery and then measure the pressures in the aorta and then push it across the aortic valve and measure the pressures in the left ventricle. Um, the pressures, um, you know, were recorded and typically are going to be a little bit different than what your brachial pressures are. But nobody wants me to put catheters in them in the office, so the company called uh, Accor developed a device that non invasively measures that. The best way to think about it is, you know, you have a reflection wave, so as the blood leaves the heart, goes out the aorta, goes down to your legs, the pressure hits the bifurcation from your aorta down into your iliac arteries. So this is like splashing water at a wall uh, in a pool, and the water comes back at you. If you have really stiff arteries, that reflection wave comes really uh, quickly back up in the atrial root, and it comes up so quickly that the blood hasn't even fully gotten out of your left ventricle when it's squeezing. So the heart is squeezing the blood out and the pressure wave is coming back in, so the heart has to squeeze even harder to get the blood out and you're measuring it right there at the aortic root. So that's called the central aortic blood pressure. Another thing that, you know, if you've had blood pressure issues uh, where it's, you know, this is not uncommon, you come to the doctor and say, oh, your blood pressure is elevated. And you say, no, it's always normal at home. Well, do you have white coat hypertension? Um, one of the reasons I don't wear white coats anymore. But it's just an excuse uh, sometimes that uh, um, patients will say, they're like, oh, it just can't be up anywhere other than the doctor's office. Well, I mean, it's pretty much a uh, stress-induced uh, elevation of blood pressure at that point. So if you're you know, late getting to the appointment or there's a lot of traffic or you, know, you pounded a Red Bull or something like that right before the office, well, your blood pressure is going to be high anytime your body's under stress like that. So it's not just in the office. So how's the best way to determine if you have true white coat hypertension? That would be with what's known as a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. It's the gold standard to tell you really what's going on with your blood pressure. It's a bicep cuff, has a little battery pack, uh, that either clipped your belt or has a little uh, kind of like fanny belt thing attachment to it. And it records one to two times an hour throughout the day. Also at least one time an hour overnight. Gives you your 24-hour average blood pressure. It gives you the burden that your blood pressures are greater than 140 over 90. So when I have that, you know, you know, I'd hear less than like 
think it's like at least less than 10 percent of the time um, but the really thing that also is useful for it is understanding what your dipping status of your blood pressure is as your blood pressure is under circadian control and you know much like everything in the body there's a time and place that uh, things are optimal so overnight your blood pressure should be dropping it should drop at least 15 percent if it doesn't then you're considered a non-dipper what does that mean your blood pressure either stays steady and your risk of stroke and heart attack are increased a reverse dipper is even worse your blood pressure is going up while you're sleeping those people are at very high risk of cardiovascular events not commonly it's due to obstructive sleep apnea so you know your airway closes off you put tremendous uh, intrathoracic pressure uh, on your heart and lungs as you're trying to open up your airway again that causes significant inflammation in the system uh, and the blood pressure is going to rise uh, in accordance to that so a 24-hour inflammatory blood pressure monitor will tell you are you an appropriate dipper or not the test also will tell you what time of day is best to take your medications um, many of the medications are once a day which is ideal for patient compliance but some of them work better taking them in the evening time some of them may work better in the morning time you know if you're on a diuretic or a water pill generally you can probably take them in the morning time because you don't want to be getting up overnight to go to the restroom often so uh, 24 hour blood pressure monitor really kind of fine tunes you uh, to individualize your uh, treatment regimen. Uh, so that's what I want to share to you guys tonight about you know, what is hypertension. Often that's an issue with nitric oxide production. Uh, how do you truly measure it? You know, don't have stimulants in the body. Be seated, uh, nice and calm, ideally for five minutes. Feet on the ground, back supported, brachial cuff. Better if somebody is listening to your blood pressure than a machine. If it's a machine, they should make sure that it's been calibrated against a uh, manual blood pressure as well. If you monitor at home and you have a device, bring it to you with your doctor's office visits and make sure your home device is similar to the one that you're getting in the office. You know, if your blood pressure isn't where it should optimally be for your cardiovascular health, uh, there's devices that can look at how much it's affecting your arteries. Are your arteries elastic? Are they starting to get really stiff? Um, there's blood work that can kind of get to the root cause of things and you know, show evidence. Do you have any um, end organ damage? You know, if you're, are you damaging the kidney? Um, you know, if you've had an echocardiogram, is your heart getting stiff? Is your heart getting thickened? And then, um, you know, what is your blood pressure average throughout the day? So that's what a 24 hour blood pressure monitor would look at, you know, to rule out that you truly have white coat hypertension. Um, there's also something called mass hypertension I get into today, but that's something you could never pick up unless you have a 24-hour blood pressure monitor. Um, because this is the unfortunate case where you come to the doctor's office and your blood pressure is always, always normal. But at home, it's high, and you don't know that. So the monitor um, can help pick that up. So that's again what I want to share with you guys tonight. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll sit around here and answer them for a few minutes. Um, if you're interested in using any type of devices that I spoke about tonight in St. Louis area, you know, Apollo Cardiology is located in the, uh, Richmond Heights or our Cosmo Gallery Mall. You know, we are open, you know, Monday through Friday to do these type of consultations to help you get to the root cause of what's driving your blood pressure issues. If you're interested in that, best way to reach out to us is through our website, it's drtwyman.com. There's a link to uh, schedule an appointment with us or uh, make a phone call through our office. So let's see if there's anything we can answer for you guys tonight. All right, so somebody wants to discuss, I assume, uh, VP, uh, I mean, blood pressure further with me. Um, so, yeah, just shoot me a message or go to our website, drtom.com, and uh, sign up for a, a chat with us. So somebody's saying, how common is it for a cardiologist's office to have these non-invasive devices? Uh, it depends on what the uh, cardiologist is uh, truly interested in, um, you know, at my prior practices. Um, I was the one that was advocating for the 24-hour blood pressure monitor um, many of the times, but many cardiologists' offices will have a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. Um, very few will have the, uh, the central aortic blood pressure device, it's called the ACCOR, few do. Um, and then the max pulse, um, that is something that uh, is interesting as well, that look at the elasticity of the arteries. You know, it's not exactly correlated to hypertension, but it is useful for that. Um, so. If you look around, you can potentially find the uh, 24 hour blood pressure monitors, but um, I, you know, uh, this is my day job. It's focusing on heart attack control prevention, so I have them all uh, put together in one, one central location. 
And somebody's asking, can the arteries go back to being flexible if they're stiff? For sure. Um, you know, there's kind of a progression of, uh, you know, are the arteries just loss of nitric oxide and they're kind of temporarily stiff? On the max pulse test, there's seven types of arterial elasticity. Type one and two are normal. Six, seven are bad. Then there's kind of a gray zone. Once you start getting six, seven, maybe you do have more fibrotic tissue or the arteries are starting to be severely calcified then the arteries may be more like a lead pipe and they're not going to get more elastic over time. But if you're kind of in that mid-range, for sure it's you know maybe a couple weeks process and the arteries can start releasing more nitric oxide uh, as you're getting rid of the insults that were causing the arteries to be stiff in the first place. So somebody's asking, can the, uh, the full body red light devices or the photo bulb modulation panels help lower blood pressure? Uh, it's very possible I mean, they can bring blood flow to um, whatever area is being um, illuminated. Um, so, you know, I would say probably more uh, caution, you know, if you're running on the low side, you know, I've not seen anybody get their blood pressure too low, they get a dizzy or lightheaded, you know, using photobiomodulation. But um, typically uh, the blood pressure response is gonna be um, through nitric oxide pathways. And that's one of the ways that uh, photomodulation works is that it's knocking nitric oxide off the uh, four cytochrome with the mitochondria. So it's possible they can help lower the blood pressure. I do have uh, two devices that I um, play around with personally. I haven't really opened them up to the patients too much, but I have a um, Weber uh, Spectra watch that has four different uh, wavelengths of light that goes right over your radial arteries. So it puts the, uh, the light right into the bloodstream. And I also have the, uh, the CareWare patch that has a red and blue diode. Blue diode um, may help the body release nitric oxide more effectively. I've not yet really monitored myself to see if it affects blood pressure. I have perfectly normal blood pressure, um, so I don't expect a difference in me, but I might start playing around with that a few patients that um, since we have these you know, non-invasive devices, you know, we could check a max pulse, an ACOR at the start of an office visit. If somebody's blood pressure is elevated or their arteries are stiff, maybe we'll do a 30 minute session with them in the office uh, put the device over the wrist, and then afterwards we'll measure their stiffness and the uh, central blood pressure and see if it improves. So I might uh, start trying to offer that for people who are interested. But very good question. So somebody's asking, how do you increase nitric oxide, you know, diet or supplements? You know, the goal always is try to remove what's damaging it in the first place. You can do that. <clears throat> but nitric oxide um, has two major pathways. You know, after the age of 40, you start relying more on the salivary pathway. So, you know, if you eat nitrates, which are gonna be mostly in greens and beets, the nitrate reducing bacteria in your saliva has to break that stuff down and then you swallow it. And then the stomach acid helps with this enzymatic reaction and you eventually make nitric oxide. So if you're using a lot of antiseptic mouthwash or lots of fluorinated products, you're going to be damaging the bacteria in your saliva, so they're not going to be able to make that conversion for you. And then if you're on an acid-blocking medicine, so I'm not advocating, this is not personal medical advice, you know, but if you're on an acid-blocking medicine, like you know, one of the proton pump inhibitors or an H2 blocker, and you don't have stomach acid, well, then you're not going to be able to digest proteins as effectively, and you're not going to make enzymes as effectively, because enzymes are proteins. So you're going to have a reduced ability to make nitric oxide. So you may want to talk to your doctors, is there another option for treating your acid reflux? Um, now, other things that can improve nitric oxide, physical activity exercise. You know, as you're exercising, the blood is rushing through the um, cardiovascular uh, system to your muscles to provide oxygen and nutrients to the muscles. There's going to be shear stress over the glycocalyx, the gel coat of the arteries. That shear stress is transmitted to the endothelium and the endothelium sensing that there's increasing blood flow because of the exercise will then cause the artery to release nitric oxide to dilate, so more blood flow comes to that muscle. So exercise, that's the major benefit, is boosting nitric oxide uh, from, a, from a hypertension standpoint. Uh, sunlight, UVA sunlight. You know, when the sun hits your skin and your skin is warm, uh, that's kind of a rough estimate for when UVA is out. If you've seen some of my prior talks when I'm down in Cancun or Puerto Rico, sometimes I bring these little beads with me. Uh, these beads are color changing beads that come from a like science supply store or something like that. It's something that science teachers, you know, use to teach kids about uh, UV light. Uh, they're white when there's uh, no UV light and when you go outside, these particular ones turn purple. 
So if there's purple, you know there's UVA outside. And when UVA hits your skin, um, the blood vessels will dilate, the red blood cells come to the surface to basically start absorbing um, the sunlight and the red blood cells are like ferry boats for that light and then transmit it to where the body needs to take that, that photonic energy. Um, now, are there supplements that can boost nitric oxide? There are, but I'm not gonna get into uh, individual supplements per se per night. You know, if you see me in the office, I can kind of tell you which ones potentially work better for you based off your individual context. So when someone says they have sporadic high blood pressure, is that normal? You know, you know, quote, high blood pressure can be, you know, situational. So again, if you have there's a high stress situation, that's normal. Um, you're gonna have higher sympathetic tone, your fight or flight response is kicked in and blood pressure is gonna be increased. Um, so it may be something where, you know, depending on how high it is, um, can have an, you know, a concern that somebody has an issue with, uh, and I've only seen one of these in my career, a theochromocytoma. Um, where you have something on your adrenal glands that's pumping out uh, these different hormones that will raise your blood pressure. Um, but that can be picked up with uh, urine and blood testing. Um, but typically, if it's sporadic, uh, you know, look if there's a situational thing that drives it, you know, somebody's short sleep, they're over caffeinated, uh, they're using some other type of stimulants, you know, try to see if there's something environmental driving it. But if that doesn't uh, easily kind of uncover it, then really a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor really is kind of uh, the gold standard to figure out what's what's potentially driving it. Uh, Someone's asking, are there breathing techniques that can increase nitric oxide? Um, you know, nasal breathing can help with it. You know, you generally have to, uh, and I don't personally do this, so I can't really uh, teach you it, but uh, there are different uh, um, pathways in your sinuses. So if you kind of are doing kind of more of a humming uh, maneuver that vibrates that and can help uh, um, release nitric oxide. So this is why it's important to try to do nasal breathing uh, so that you can have that uh, um, pathway work better. So if you're always an obligate mouth breather, you're going to tend to have lower nitric oxide. So some of the biohackers will tape their mouth shut when they're sleeping to kind of force that to happen. Guys, I think I got to the bottom of the questions tonight. Very good questions. You know, hypertension, extremely common, but there's usually going to be a cause. You know, it's not necessarily a disease per se. It's not I-10 as the ICD-10 codes would indicate. So, you know, look to your environment, check the blood pressure, you know, the correct way to make sure that it's truly high, and then work with somebody who can try to get to the root cause of what's driving the blood pressure elevations. So, have a great week, guys. We'll see you next week, Monday, 6 p.m. Central Time. The topic is going to be the Monday night will be Ask Me Anything. So I'll open up to any cardiovascular questions or any type of longevity biohacking questions that you may have. So we'll see you next time.